Hi, everyone. Firstly, thank you to all of you who uh, prayed for me and uh, the Army Cadet um, annual field exercise that I was on in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, for the last two weeks, we had 800 cadets, um, 400 each week, and there were wonderful opportunities to minister to them and to walk the journey with them, to share the gospel with some of them, and to be able to distribute another 90 Bibles uh, as they came to ask for them. And so there was a great blessing in the midst of it. We had three chaplains in the first week and two of us in the second week. Uh, just a joy to be together with those cadets and to see God moving in amongst them and the staff. Even though they didn't know it was God moving, they knew that, that there was a great blessing amongst them, even in the midst of storms when all their hoochies got blown away and, <coughs> and uh, their beds got wet. There was that sense of uh, fun and, and excitement and we had just a great time. A lot of... Uh, well, a lack of sleep, but we got there. This morning, I've been very mindful of our world events and uh, very mindful of being amongst uh, Australian Defence Forces and the sorts of things that are going on there and hearing things like uh, Mr Putin in Russia and the threats of nuclear war and the threats of... Um, possible things from our north and the chaos that seems to be running around our world so much at the moment and even in our local scene when people are struggling with their uh, higher interest rates and their mortgages and, and higher costs of living and all of the pressures that seem to be coming amongst people and uh, people struggling, people who are homeless, people who... Uh, are really struggling to make ends meet. And uh, I was thinking about all of those things and I thought about this word content. What does it mean to be content? When you hear that word, what do you think of? Do you have enough? Hello, is that right? <laughs> Feedback? Is that one on over here? Hang on. Does that make a difference? Turn that one off. How are you going there? Okay. When you think of that word content, I think sometimes in our um, to be content means in our culture to be happy, and I'm not sure that it means that. So my question to us is, do you have enough? Is your life fulfilled? Is it what it should be for you? Whatever it is that you face in your life, whether it is the struggles that others are facing and finding it hard to make ends meet, whether it is in your life that you find yourself growing older and your body just doesn't work the same that it, as it used to be and things are starting to fail, whether it is that you fall down some stairs and you hurt your neck and, and you think, oh get frustrated with all of that and the pain that goes with it or have surgery on your hand and having to walk that journey and is life the way it should be for you? It's quite unusual for us to use that word content in our society really because I think it is that we keep on pursuing and pursuing more and more and more. We pursue more money we pursue uh, things that we're going to buy, things that we're going to achieve, things that we aspire to. We hear that people who have, that people uh, having enough or not having enough is the norm. We just don't have enough. We need more and more and more because our culture tells us there's always more. And I think in the Christian life, I think there is a need for us to have a holy discontent in the place that we are in our place with God. I think there's always more with God, isn't there? There's always more to be uh, with him and to be deeper with him and to be experiencing him more and more. So I think there's a need for us to have a holy discontent, but 
what I want to talk about in our, li- in our time today is having a contentedness, having that sense of God in our lives and having that, knowing that he is enough for us. As we look at being content, and before we read the scripture, I want to explain the story of a life who you will know and who we'll refer to today and where the, who the scripture is written by. He was the mo- one of the most satisfied and content people who ever lived. He wrote down uh, that what he discovered about contentment, about satisfaction in this life, and he wrote a letter about it. Firstly, I want to tell you a little bit about how he lived. This man was born many, many years ago in a small, a very, very well-off family that had a high position in society. They were well-respected and he grew up pursuing very serious studies. He was a brilliant man, a man who was well-educated. He studied to become well-respected and established person in the community. He particularly chose a field of study that was very affluent and uh, was very well regarded. He studied uh, with all of his heart and he was a rising star as most people saw him. He was mentored by one of the greatest leaders in their community and so people had high expectations of this man. Finally, when he had completed his studies, he became another teacher in their town, another well-respected leader in his own right. So he seemed to have everything going for him. You might think that when he reached this point in his life, that he discovered the secret to contentment and to happiness and to having enough. And I think we have that expectation in our own society that if we have the right degrees, the right amount of income, the right money in the bank, the right house and the right car, we reach a contentedness and, a, and a, almost a pinnacle of happiness. But for this man, this was not so. And his story goes on. It was about halfway through his life that he experienced a dramatic event. He became completely blind losing all of his vision. But this incident only lasted for three days. But during these three days, he realised that everything he was pursuing, everything that he was giving life to, was wrong. He, he um, He had it all wrong. His life was turned upside down when he realised that everything he was giving himself over to was meaningless. It was wrong. And so he began to reconsider his ways, to change his ways. And the people he once persecuted with his power and status in his society, he now became one of them. The people who once regarded him highly now hated him and despised him. And the people who he once persecuted didn't trust him and were even more afraid of him because they didn't understand. He lost all of his respect. He lost all of his community. And not a single person trusted him but one. This one person invested in him and taught him and sent him off on a life that was completely different. And as he lived out this life, he entered into the same sort of persecution that he had pursued with his power previously. He experienced a lot of pain and suffering in his entire life. On five different occasions, when he was caught by the people he left, he was whipped and severely, severely to the point where his muscle was visible and he bled profusely. On five different occasions, he received 39 lashes. Three other occasions, he was beaten with rods. The fact that this man was able to live beyond these acts was miraculous in itself. 
And another time he was taken outside the city and he was stoned. Rocks were thrown all over his body and afterwards he was dragged away and left for dead. But he lived on through each of these experiences of suffering and he was able to keep going. On numerous other occasions, he was journeying to a place on a ship and numerous times the ship he was on was shipwrecked. It was as if life was out to get this man. As if suffering was going to be his only existence. And it wasn't just shipwrecks or whippings or beatings or stoning. It was persecution from his own flesh, which he described as a thorn. That didn't give him any peace, but it pursued him and tormented him. It didn't give him any ease or comfort. Wherever he went, it was digging at him. It was as if this man lived a life of complete suffering. What an exciting story. (laughs) Despite this life of suffering and torment, he found contentment. He wrote words about this contentment in Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read these if it's not too small. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Remember the background? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It goes on. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is anything, any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Whoops. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. That's for me in some of my situations I have found sometimes almost impossible. And I don't know about you, but it's hard to be in that place, isn't it? So I don't think that Paul, Paul, the apostle who wrote this, was talking about our glib sense of surface happiness. There was a depth of this man that abided with God in every single circumstance. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to have contentment in life. Two years before the Apostle Paul's life concluded in execution, he was sitting in jail writing this letter. And I don't know if you know what a Roman jail is li- was like. It wasn't lovely concrete or lovely well-built cells that had a nice bed and maybe a TV or a toilet 
in there and a basin to wash from. Generally, the floor, one part of the floor had an open grate system because the, the levels, it was multi-level and so there was cell upon cell upon cell. So the man at the, or the person, at the prisoner at the top needed to relieve himself of his bodily waste, did it through the grate and it went down to the next one and to the next one and the guys and the prisoners one after the other had to excrete them excrete their bodily waste onto the cell below them that'd be pleasant wouldn't it so paul was in a prison just like that we hear all of the stories of his life he discovered though in the midst of all of that to be satisfied in his life this discovery wasn't found in the first part of his life when he had high status when he was well respected or had a place in society among leaders the discovery in being content was made in the second part of his life when it was filled with abuse and danger with torture and with suffering he felt like he had enough. Not, oh boy, I've just had enough. No, no, I've got enough in my life. I'm satisfied and content in my life. It's one thing for a rare, very rich man or rich person how he found content, he finds contentment and happiness. We don't pay too much attention to people like that because we know because we respect that they will have or we expect that they will have enough but circumstances are far different from the from yours i don't really care about what you tell me about happiness it's quite clear where you get yours from it's from your bank account it's from those things that you have accumulated i don't have those things i'm finding it's a struggle to meet, make ends meet. I'm finding a struggle to even find a rental place to live in. I'm finding a struggle to pay the exorbitant rent that you want. I'm finding a struggle even to pay for my groceries. You have your richness and your uh, supply. You find your contentment, but I don't find the contentment there. You would... <laughs> When you hear about someone whose life has been filled with danger and suffering and hardship tell you that they know how to be content, your ears prick up and you think, what is this nutcase talking about? You would be a fool not to listen to what they have to say when they say this because when they say this, they come out of experience and they come out of a place where you would never expect there to be contentment you expect contentment in plenty and in provision but when a person walks through suffering you expect that there'll be no contentment and we listen to what the apostle paul says not that i am speaking of being in need for i have learned in whatever situation i am to be content i don't need a house or a car i don't need a flash job and a high paying a, a high paid salary I don't need those things because in every situation whether good or bad whether lacking or with big supply I have learned to be content you see he's writing to the church at Philippi the church that he planted over 10 years before before he'd wrote this letter he's writing them to thank he, them for supporting him because they were the only church that supported him through this hard time in his life and he's thanking them for their financial and spiritual support because he knew for them that uh, that them being generous and giving means that there will be a reward for them as well from God and he writes that he was content even though he was in need even before he needed their help he was content and satisfied in this life he was content in all those concerns and needs. And he's writing to these believers because he knows this one thing, 
that contentment conquers your concerns. And it's not just to have a feeling of contentment, but he writes from a relationship with God and a knowledge and trust of God because God has brought him through. And no matter what you face in your life, God is faithful. I can tell you from my own experience, God is faithful. And sometimes even when you think that he's abandoned you, he has never abandoned you. Paul's writing to tell us and to tell that church at Philippi, whether you give me support, which I'm very grateful for, or not, I am content. But what does this contentment mean? There is a man who was a Puritan. Uh, his name's Jeremiah Burroughs, and he wrote a small book, and he gave a, a good definition for contentment. And he says this, Christian contentment, is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. That's quite a good definition. Let's read it again. That sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. God is faithful. No matter what you're in, God is faithful. And God's promises are sure. No matter what's going on around you, you are completely satisfied in having God alone. It's easy to sing songs like, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. It's easy to sing those words, but in experience, is it true? Paul had learned to be content. It's a process. He had to learn it. It's not just flick and it's on. We, we, we're not inherently content. We're always looking for more and that's okay because if we're going to grow in life, we need to look for more. But it's not about the material things or about having those comforts. It's about pursuing those things of God which makes us discontent in this life. And we see this illustrated in the Egyptians. And if you uh, like Egyptian history and you like watching the documentaries about the mummies and and not the daddies, but the mummies and uh, the, the, uh, all of their tombs and stuff and how they would accumulate um, gold and, and treasures and, and uh, chariots and uh, pets and, and they would put them all in the tomb for them so that when they went to paradise, they'd have them there. Fat good they did because now we're digging them up after a thousand years, the pets are still there, all rotted away and so is the all the treasures or they've been robbed by others. So they didn't do them too much at all. We know that you can't take anything into the afterlife because there's no tow bar on your hearse. You can't hook up the trailer and take it with you. And I know that by experience. <laughs> but I've known people as you have who live and act Uh, in their lives as if they can take their possessions with them, accumulating, putting them all together as if they can, when they die, they can all be with them. The Jews have this wonderful uh, uh, philosophy in terms of of, uh, funerals and burials. Every single person gets a pine board coffin with rope handles and straw in it. Whether you're the richest man in the town or the poorest, you get the same coffin. And in the Jewish Talmud, it talks about how when a baby is born, it, it's born with clenched fists because uh, it's there to grab everything it can throughout its life. But when that baby's older and it dies, it dies with an open palm because he's got to let it all go because you can't take it with you. <laughs> Some put so much energy into pursuing things that it seems like they believe they can take it with them. 
we spend so much time and energy into getting more and we waste so much energy in pursuing things that God sometimes takes second place in our lives, doesn't he? In uh, the book of 1 Timothy from Paul again, he says to Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Think about that. We aren't content. That's why the gold lotto has so many, uh, so bigger jackpots. I was looking at a thing of the Italian... Um, the current Italian lottery and the ja- or the amount in the lottery is four over four hundred million Australian dollars. Four hundred million dollars. I don't know what I'd do with four hundred million dollars. Maybe give me an opportunity. I'll give it a go. But um, <laughs> but we pursue it more and more and more. But Paul says. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. We have enough. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Interesting. You take nothing into this world, you take nothing out. He says that if we have food, we will be content. If it is possible that we can pursue money and things so much that we can turn away from our relationship with God. That's what he's saying. This is a very stern warning. And he says, I know, back into Philippians 4, I know how, how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ, through him, through Christ who th- strengthens me. I don't know, as a young Christian, I thought, oh, I'll take that verse and I, and I can do anything that I want and, and Jesus will give me strength to do it. No, 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 that's not the context. The context is whatever situation God takes me in, I can walk through that situation because Jesus will give me the strength to do it. When I was thinking about this, I thought, and Kerry will know what one of these things is, it's a gimbal. You know what a gimbal is? She's a photographer and this is a photography thing. A gimbal is a contraption, if you like, a piece of equipment that you hook your camera up to to hold the camera steady. So if someone is filming with that camera, say a video, and they're following someone else with it, that holds it steady. It doesn't bounce up and down with your steps. It holds it nice and steady and you point it into the direction. And the camera is stabilised. Paul is saying that he has found his gimbal in life. Even when he faces situations in his life that bring him to the lowest point, he continues to remain content because his gimbal keeps him steady and stabilised. Who? Christ is his gimbal. Christ is the one who keeps him stabilised. Are you in a place today that is unsteady? When you're facing things that aren't working so well anymore, when you're facing things that you have to give away because you can't cope with them or maybe you're older and you can't have them anymore because you just not uh, your body doesn't cope anymore. Maybe you're facing life with a walking stick or a walker or maybe you, uh, some of the, the vision is, is failing or all of those sorts of things. You don't stand up very well anymore. You're not so steady on your feet. All of those things come to us from t- at some time or other in a situation that is bringing you to a lowest point. Are you facing some suffering and challenges in your own life that no one else sees? 
You're not isolated. And it is in this community that you can find support and hope. That's why God wants us to gather together. It's possible that through horrible situations, we can learn to be content and to know that we have enough. Have you ever been on a flight when the pilot comes on the, uh, the intercom and says, uh, would you please ensure that your seatbelts are fastened? We're going to be soon facing some turbulence. Don't you love it when you go through tur- t- turbulence in the plane? And the, uh, your drink falls out. You're all having a lot of trouble. You get a little bit of air sickness. You can't read what you were reading before. Well, why can't the if the pilot knows that the turbulence is coming, why can't he divert around the turbulence and uh, then you don't have to face it at all? Well, the reason is that he's got a destination to go to and he's fixed on that destination no matter what turbulence comes his way. And God is taking us to a destination through the turbulence of life. I renew of a lady in a certain country, I've heard this story of a lady in a certain country where um, there is lots of persecution and she belonged to a certain religion and it was that she came to faith in Christ Uh, and then when her, her husband and her mother found out that she had come to faith in Christ and had denied the other religion in this particular country, that her husband grabbed her by the hair and dragged her out of the house and put her in the square of the town, and this is a true story, and doused her with fuel and set her alight, expecting her to burn to death, but she survived. And she was miraculously taken from that certain country and taken to the UK where she would have some plastic surgery to try and help her in the horrific burns that she had experienced in, uh, back where she was. And people uh, were really questioning how is it that she can survive with all of these horrific burns in, in just the way she looks. And, and someone said, but she's a beautiful lady. She's a really lovely person in herself. And when asked how she she can continue, she said this. It is perfectly reasonable to find the very best of God in the very worst of circumstances. (laughs) A good pilot knows what he is doing and has a destination in mind. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, Unerring wisdom ordained your lot and selected for you the safest and best condition. Remember this, had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. You are placed by God in the most suitable circumstances. But that lady got burned. Are they the most suitable circumstances? Through those circumstances, God was her rock and her stay and she said it's perfectly reasonable to expect the best of God in the the worst of circumstance. Remember that saying. I'll put it back there so you can see. It's perfectly reasonable to find the very best of God in the very worst of circumstances. If there is a set of circumstances that would be better for your life and for your destination, God would have put you there. And it takes trust from our point to know that God knows what he's doing. He is sovereign and he is wise. Yes, there is a cost to follow Jesus, but through it we become more like Jesus. Paul knows what it is to be content in want and abundance. No matter what the circumstance, he remained content. In in Proverbs 30 verses 8 to 9, it says, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Don't give me either. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and saying, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. To be rich, I can easily turn my back on God. To be in poverty, I can easily turn my back on God. 
But the prayer is, God, put me in the place that you want me to be so that I can serve you properly and I can be content. It's easy when times are good to be distracted by things and circumstances and to become self-reliant. God, give me what I can be trusted with so that I can continue to be content in you. So there's nothing wrong with having things. The problem is when things have you. God, give me enough. (laughs) Because there's no trailer on the hearse. Paul had discovered the secret of having this contentedness. For he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret. That's the secret of contentment, of trusting Christ. Because he knows. Satisfaction and contentment are found in the sufficiency of Christ. For we read in 2 Corinthians 12 when Paul was talking about the thorn in the flesh and Jesus said, and he's saying, take it away from me, take it away from me, take it away from me. And Jesus says to him, if you read in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. My question is, is God enough for you? Is God enough for me? God is enough. He can satisfy all the desires of our hearts. Only God can satisfy the needs and thirst in our lives. God created you to have desires and wants, but he created you to have your wants and desires to be in him. We read in Psalm 42, nearly finished. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so, my, uh, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Why are you ca- And then verse 11, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him and my salvation, or praise him my salvation and my God. God is the only one who can satisfy your thirst in your life. Money can't, although money's a good tool. Your job can't. Social media can't. And how many friends we have on social media can't. Although good, solid friends in our lives, skin-on-skin friends, are important and necessary. Only The satisfaction in the depths of our being can be satisfied by God. Sometimes when God is seemingly nowhere to be seen, when you stumble into sin, remember that Christ's strength is enough. When a loved one is diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, when your spouse, the person who you've committed your life to, decides to leave you with a trampled heart and a hole in your soul, when someone comes at you with false accusation, when someone you know criticises you, when life is seemingly falling apart, when your child abandons God and walks away from, uh, into sin, walks away from God, when life becomes unbearable and all I want to do is die. And I've had cadets talk about that this, these last two weeks. At the age of 10, when someone... Has, reports to me at the age of 10 they had suicidal ideation. When at 12 or 13 it's coming back again. And you walk with them. Life is falling apart even at that young age. When a young man is, has a severe shoulder injury because his 18, a 14 year old, because his 18 year old brother was strangling him till, till he blacked out and almost ripping his arm out of the socket. When other things happen in people's lives, their lives seem to fall apart. God is enough. Remember that in every circumstance, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul had had enough in Jesus. 
he, he could have just let one of the shipwrecks take him to the bottom of the ocean. Paul didn't endure of all of the things he did because he was extraordinarily strong. He found his strength in Christ. God is enough. He saw that Jesus is glorified in a beaten down disciple who continues to trust him. He looked back at the cross where his saviour died for him. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, it was the completion of his sacrifice for us and it meant that he paved the way for us to know him and the contentment in life that is not wrapped up in circumstances but in Jesus. So my question to us today is this. Is God enough for you? I ask that question to myself. Is God enough for me? In the circumstances of my life, when it all seems to fall apart, when I don't think that I can continue on, when I pray, God, I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning, would you take me to be with you? This is too hard. When those things happen in your life, he says, I'm enough for you. My grace is sufficient. In your weakness, my power is made perfect. God is enough. Let us pray. Lord God, we look at the circumstances of our world. We look at the circumstances of our lives, some of those private things that no one else sees. Some of the torments, some of those mental health issues, some of those circumstances that have left wounds and scars, and we're frightened. We become sometimes those people who try to trust in ourselves in the midst of those circumstances, but dear God, in the the words of the Apostle Paul in that place of his own life when he was shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned and, and lashed and stoned, yet he could say, in all of those situations, I've learned to be content. Help us to come to that place where we trust you enough, for you are enough. For as you ask that question of us this morning, am I enough for you? Our hearts would cry out, yes. Our flesh says, I don't know. We doubt, we struggle. But today we come before you and we would bend our knee before you in a sense and we would say, God, our God, we surrender to you as best we can. You are our strength, for we can serve you and have contentment because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we submit ourselves to you today, dear God, and I pray over every person here, every person who's watching on a live stream, every person who would come in the hearing of your word from, from, Philippi, from Philippians 4, and I pray to God, the peace of God which passes all understanding that would guard our hearts and our minds in the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord, that we would have that place of contentment and satisfaction in you. And we pray this in the name of that one who strengthens us, Jesus. Amen. Worship his holy names.